Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks for the nice introduction. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk with um, the Orange Audubon Society, our sister group down in Orlando. And um, I'm up here in Gainesville. Uh, it's springtime here too. And we're enjoying some of these same birds that are starting to filter in. And it's just just beginning. And it's always been one of my favorite times of year. And uh, the the topic I'm going to talk about tonight certainly adds a little spice to our spring migration. Um, let's see. I'm trying to, for some reason it's not forwarding. There we go. So I kind of cut my teeth and my career as a tropical biologist, as you, um, in my introduction, rattled off a number of places I visited, um, particularly in Peru, where I studied bamboo specialist for my dissertation at uh, the Louisiana State University, uh, the Museum of Natural Sciences there, uh, including with Ted Parker. And uh, I, th this was just kind of my love for a long time. Um, and then I got to go on a number of expeditions. We, I was on the team that discovered the scarlet banded barbet in Northern Peru in 1996. And then when I came to UF to the Florida Museum of Natural History in 1997, I started working with Dave Stedman in the, in the uh, South Pacific. And there we discovered that this frog mouth, which had previously been lumped with tawny frogmouth, a widespread frogmouth in Australia and New Guinea. Um, we, with the specimen research that we did, looking at the genetics and some behavioral aspects, and especially the skeleton, we discovered that it wasn't a tawny frogmouth at all. It wasn't even related to any other frogmouth. And we were able to place it in a new genus, um, Rigida penis. And that was a very exciting moment for me. But all that kind of scientific stuff aside, I started birding, just as many of you are birders, um, as uh, a teenager in California in uh, the San Mateo County, just south of San Francisco. And one of my favorite things was to pop over the hill and go to the Pigeon Point Lighthouse, this promontory that's great for seabird watching. And in the spring, it's especially good for watching loons. And you can sit there at the lighthouse with your scope and literally see thousands of Pacific loons passing in a day on a good day. You can also see black-footed albatrosses and sheer waters and everything else. And it was just a phenomenal place and it kind of hooked me on seabird watching. So now here in Gainesville, we don't get much opportunity to do seabird watching. Um, we have to wait for one of these to come along. This is Hurricane Matthew in 2016. And once in a while, nature throws us a bone here in the middle of the Florida Peninsula. And we get something like a black cat petrel on Noonan's Lake right in the middle of the peninsula. Uh, this is kind of a one day wonder. I think every, almost every active uh, Gainesville birder was able to get out there and see this bird. Uh, one of only a few records ever inland in, um, in Florida or even anywhere in the world. Um, it, it, it was just a tremendous record. But that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm going to talk about common loons. And this is really an iconic species, especially as you go further north. If anybody has seen on Golden Pond, the soundtrack is filled with the wails and howls of their breeding song from these little lakes that dot Canada and the northern US. Uh, it also occurs in uh, Northern Europe and Asia. The US population uh, was estimated in 2004 at about 600,000 birds. It's been in a somewhat of a decline. It was really bad decline in the kind of the acid rain years in the 1980s, uh, but it's stabilized a little bit, but it's still considered a bird of concern. Um, in Canada, they even have the loon on their $2 coin, which they affectionately call a loony. 94% um, of this population is, of the breeding population is in Canada, 
but it also has numbers in Minnesota and Michigan and in Maine. So in the winter, they fly south and they mainly become coastal, uh, wintering along the Pacific coast, the Atlantic coast, and um, especially the Gulf of Mexico. It's thought that most of the Eastern population of breeding loons winters in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, here's a bunch of loons in winter plumage. In the spring, they have to get back to their breeding areas. So these arrows just kind of give my, before I got in, in interested in loons, I, this is what I thought happened, that the Gulf of Mexico ones went north and the other ones followed the coast. Um, and, you know, they just pretty much, the they just followed the direction back to their, their breeding grounds. So, what I found uh, kind of threw a monkey wrench into this whole thought of process that I had about just heading north. And that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. And I'm gonna talk about the discovery of a new migratory route, um, some of the results and patterns of our uh, research on this over the last 20 years. And then I'm gonna finish with a little bit about conservation of common loons. Okay, so, I said discovery that, like, but this pattern, this um, this knowledge about loons migrating over Florida, over the Florida Peninsula, didn't begin in uh, in my my time. It actually started with Frank Chapman. That's the Frank Chapman that started the um, Christmas bird count. He before he did that, he came to Gainesville and observed and collected birds for the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and in his publication in the uh, in 1888, he said that from March 31st to April 17th, he saw about 15 loons flying at great altitude over Florida, over Gainesville. And this is the typical behavior that I was later to find. Okay. So jump ahead a hundred years, a little bit more than a hundred years. Um, Rex Rowan is kind of the patriarch of Gainesville birding. He was the nexus around which all communication about bird sightings and bird happenings uh, centered. And so I had just, I moved Gainesville in the late nineties and got an email from Rex and it's, or he sent out a, a group email, which was the popular way of communicate at the time. And he said, well, it's late March. It's time to start looking for those flying bowling pins, those bowling pins with wings. Uh, that's common loon flying over. And I kind of scratched my head and said, this is Gainesville, look for common loons. But I knew Rex was almost certainly right. So I went out. Well, let's just a little bit of backdrop. Um, here we are at the Florida Peninsula, you know, and I mentioned that there's birds that come up from, from the Gulf of Mexico or along the coast. So I really didn't think much about loons flying over Gainesville right in the center of the peninsula. So in 2000 in the spring, um, I was out in my yard and I was thinking about Rex's message. And sure enough, I looked up in the sky and on three different days, I saw loons flying over in this kind of this March, April window. And my, my, uh, my reason for watching the sky, of course, was to get a new yard bird, which was very important to me. And common loon was a difficult bird to get on your yard list when you live inland in Florida. And sure enough, I got that one. And 2001, I moved to a new place, but I was out of town for two springs in a row. So in 2003, I started watching from my backyard. This is the backyard of the place I live now. Um, and in seven or so days of, of backyard watching the sky, uh, I saw 63 loons, which really had me scratching my head uh, between March and uh, 21st of March, 4th of April, including on one day, I saw 32 different loons. And again, here we are in the center of the peninsula. Loons are known to be coastal migrants. Loons 
their their body is so specialized for diving the feet are in the back of the body they can't land on land they, if they land on land they're a you know pardon the pun a, a dead duck because they're unable to get back up in the air so they rely on expanses of open water for migration and for because of that reason they're really hesitant to fly over land so what the heck was going on? Why were these birds flying over Alachua County and Gainesville? Okay, so I live next door to a, to a cemetery and my sky view in my house was not that great for watching migrants. So in 2004, I started going out into the cemetery to watch birds and I spent about seven days and then in 2005, I did the same. And in 2006, I, I was finding kind of the same pattern. There seemed to be a good number of loons flying. In 2006, though, I spent 29 days out there. I, and this is your typical view of a loon flying over. They fly high and they fly fast. And so you really have to kind of pay attention, scan the sky, keep your, be very aware, keep your eyes on the horizon. And I found that by scanning with binoculars, both kind of the Western sky, waiting for these loons to show up, I could pick up more and more of them. Um, so with these refined methods and more data, in 2006, I found 460 loons. Now this is way more than I, than I really thought possible, um, including I saw on one day alone, I saw 117. Now, initially I thought that these were loons were migrants from some of the lakes like Lake Weir, uh, some of the other lakes around in central Florida harbor populations of loons that might be heading north, but not 460. And then later on that spring, on the 5th of April, I saw 192 loons in one day. And I'm not a great photographer, as you can see, but this is a flock that had 37 birds. This is just 12 of them. And it shows the typical loon migrant, uh, look of a loon migrant flock. They're, what I found out is a great word for it. They're socially distance, distant. They don't fly in Vs or lines like cormorants or ducks. They fly in these loose aggregations with some distance between them. They're flying bowling pin looks and their wing beats are fast and they have a very distinct look. And I can now pick up, after a while of looking at them, I can pick up loons at a good mile away in binoculars. And they just have such a distinctive flight style that uh, it was getting easier and easier to pick them up. But I was you know, unprepared, like I said, to see so many birds um, flying over Gainesville. So, in 2006, I kind of started putting it together. And what I found, the birds aren't flying north at all. They're flying northeast to east-northeast, this small sector, almost you know, 95% of them are in this one avenue crossing over Gainesville. The loons are also diurnally in a very restricted little time frame. They pass one to two hours after sunrise. Okay, and what we know about loon biology, we know their airspeed, there's some publications on this, they fly about 60 miles per hour. Um, and we know, like I mentioned, they do not like to fly over land. They need these expansive waters. So from these two, kind of these group of facts, we can kind of infer if we trace back Southwest down the migration path, they're flying Northeast. So we're looking for where they're coming from. They're leaving Cedar Key and we give them a little bit of time, the 60 mile per hour, and they're leaving right at sunrise, which is typical loon behavior. They like when they're migrating to leave right at sunrise. And they're passing over Gainesville about 50 minutes later. The same flight direction and speed would bring them to the Atlantic Ocean in Northern St. Johns County and Southern Duval County about two hours after sunrise. And this is almost 200 kilometers in all, or about 120 miles. So here's a little picture of what I think is going on, what I thought was going on pretty much. Um, I thought that the loons that wintered south of Cedar Key and maybe farther out into the Gulf of Mexico were congregating at Cedar Key 
coming there and staging. And then when the dawn came the next morning, they would hop over the Florida Peninsula, taking them straight over Gainesville. And if you notice this map of Florida, if you look, most of Florida is pretty wide if you want to take this path across it. But if, when you get to Cedar Key, you get to the narrowest portion that you can kind of cross northeast and, can, and be into the Atlantic Ocean. So they're taking the shortest distance across the Florida Peninsula. Like I said, they don't like to fly, fly over land. And then once in the Atlantic, they're able to continue on up to Eastern Canada, Maine, wherever they might be breeding. So they can go thousands of miles up the Atlantic Ocean without flying over land. And this is a great benefit to them. And so when I put all this together, I wrote a paper in the Florida Field Naturalist uh, in 2009 that explained all of this. <clears throat> so after a couple of years of doing field work during the spring, I was back in 2009. I wanted to get back to my loons, uh, see, you know, try to get a bet, even a better idea of what was happening. And that year I was able to see even more 507. But what I did also was start to recruit some other observers, some friends and birders in the Gainesville area. And the total was from all observers was 711. And so here's a little graph of this contribution of is pretty much I was seeing the same amount of birds, but by adding observers to different sites, we were able to bump up the number to 711. Okay, and then after 2009, I had a couple of years where I was teaching and pretty busy in 2010 and 11. And then I started 2012, I started doing pretty much the same sort of research with contributions from friends and colleagues and birders. And that's pretty much the graph. Every year, there's quite a bit of variability, you know, more than uh, from the lowest to the highest, it's, it's more than double. Um, so is just trying to get an idea of what was going on, but I was also thinking, boy, it'd be great to expand the study, to bring more observers in to get a better idea of what was happening. At the same time, in the mid 2000s, tens, um, the loon population, well, we know that the loons are even more common on the Gulf of Mexico in the panhandle than they are south of, uh, in the peninsular part of Florida. And the Christmas counts of, of uh, in the panhandle, they have thousands of loons compared to hundreds in the, uh, in the peninsular part of Florida. Um, there was lots of anecdotal observations of loons flying north over Tallahassee, uh, but we really didn't have much of a grip on what was happening there. So this uh, a biologist named Paul Spitzer, he's worked on osprey and loons and a lot of other uh, animals, uh, a re retired uh, professor, he started doing loon observation at St. Mark's. And St. Mark's is really cool. It's right on the water there at the lighthouse. And he can see the loons coming right off the water, right at sunset. And some of the things that he found were really interesting. First, he was looking, seeing a lot of birds returning. He would see them come off the, the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico heading north, and then they would turn around and come back. The second thing is that the birds were really vocally active. They were doing a lot of talking to one another. And then comparing my site, so I'm 75 miles inland compared to Paul's site right on the coast. I don't have any vocalizations. I have, I've seen now thousands and thousands of loons in the spring migration here. I have never once heard them. During the winter, I hear them on the lake sometimes, but never once have I seen a flying loon in Gainesville vocalized. I've seen uh, less than a handful of, of returns, never seen them turn around. So this is a different, a real behavioral difference. And I'm seeing them uh, a good chunk of, of time after sunrise, whereas Paul was seeing them right at sunrise. And then again, Paul was seeing them right on the coast 
Uh, he would see them even before sunrise and the birds were vocalizing. And so what Paul was finding was that they, th these returns, these birds that were turning around were just gaining altitude. And during days when there was like a rain clouds or, or bad weather, north winds or whatever, they would get up in the air, kind of scout it out, talk to one another, and then turn around and go back. If you look at Gainesville, we're about halfway across. By the time they get to Gainesville, they're committed. They don't, they're just gonna go hell, you know, they're, they're, they're whole hog into making it across the Florida Peninsula and they're not gonna stop. So this behavioral, this, this, the, the birds are very socially aware of one another. They're making decisions. They're trying to figure out, is this a good day for migrants or not? So as I mentioned before, I was really interested in getting a better handle on how large this um, migration was across the Florida Peninsula. And I decided I'd like kind of do a citizen science approach uh, by, by um, recruiting more volunteer observers at more sites. I, I needed to place the site so, so we weren't double counting. This is kind of the idea that we proposed um, to have a number of sites, um, five to 10 observers spaced, you know, this distance apart, so we wouldn't double count, um, and then man these sites from uh, middle of March to middle of April. Um, and then St. Mark's, we proposed kind of to do the same thing. Uh, it's a lot narrower there. Um, and there's not as much access to have as many observers. And we floated this idea to Duke Energy. They wanted to uh, kind of green up their reputation and uh, they have this environmental project and we were success and successful in, in getting funding for our project. So in 2020 and then in, again last year, I had I erected these eight stations that had good views of the sky. I set up uh, sites on the internet for people to sign up to stay at these sites in this, you know, from like an hour and a half each morning. Uh, and in total, I got greater than 75% coverage over the eight sites over the 33 or so days that we did the census. So they go from south of Micanopy up to, uh, to Hague Dairy. Excuse me. Yes. Okay, so the results. In 2020, uh, Paul up at St. Mark's he had outbound, as these are northbound birds heading um, north. There were 10 hunt, 1,090 loons, a pretty good number, of course, uh, way higher than what I'd found previously in Gainesville. Um, but 309 of them were returns. So that was a remarkable finding. Um, I'm gonna mention this median date statistic. The median date is the day that divides half the one, half the population came before, half the population uh, of migrating loons came after. Um, so that's an important, that's kind of a statistic of when the migration is happening across the whole spring. Um, and the high count he had was 236 on one day on the 28th of March. And so the results for the Gainesville site where we had eight counts, um, look at those numbers, 2,190 loons, of course with the increased Coverage that I'm surprised that we had a, a much higher number than we had before. Uh, look at the number of returns, three birds going backwards. So this is two orders of magnitude different. So like I said, the birds have made up their mind by the time they get to Gainesville. The median date was a little bit later, one April, which I will get into later. And the high count uh, was on the 31st of March, 325. So this is the 2021 results. Paul went out to St. Mark's and the COVID thing, all of a sudden it was bad in 2020 and then it ramped up again in the spring of 2021. Paul uh, is from Maryland and you know he needs accommodations and he needs to eat in restaurants and stuff. And it just wasn't safe for him to stay. So he had to pull out way earlier than he, than before he could get much data for 2021, unfortunately. Uh, we, because Gainesville is mostly, uh, the sites are mostly staffed by people that live here and loon watching can be a solo activity. 
um, we were able to have equal coverage as we had the year before. And we had 2,322 loons. Um, we had four loons returned, so it's still a minuscule number. Median date was very similar to the year before, and the high count was also similar. Uh, that was the 30th of March. Okay, so overall, over these 2,000 loons in both 2020 and 2021, the highest before that was 800. So increasing the coverage really pumped up the numbers. Um, in this 20 plus years that I've been doing this, I had 12 years of good data. So this is when I had figured out the pattern when I was here and when I had pretty good numbers of people helping me out. And in that time, we've had over 10,000 common loons fly over Gainesville. So this is what the graph looks like of every year from early 2003, and then the little spike in 2006. Um, if you look, at, it gives both my numbers in white and then the other observers in yellow. And you see my numbers haven't changed all that much, but the big peak, the big change has been the number uh, provided by other observers. Of course, you can't really look at population trends unless you control for effort. And so effort is how much time you're spending. And so if you have eight people spending eight, you know, eight people days in the field, that's a lot different than one person. And so to do that, you divide the number of loons by the numbers of of people, uh, of sites occupied per day. So if I'm looking at population trend for the whole time, and this is controlling for effort, it's really, there's not much happening. It's, there's just a lot of noise, it seems. There's no significant trend at all. This is for all eight sites at the Gainesville site. But one thing that I do have is I have my own observation, which were always done at the same site, always done by the same person, and I can control for a little bit of that noise. Uh, I show my numbers in red here. And again, looking from 2012 on is when I have the best data. As I hear the numbers look a little bit neater, um, it's still not significant. Uh, statistically, but there definitely seems to be some sort of trend. And the trend, unfortunately, is decreasing numbers through time. Um, that's largely a result of high numbers in these two years, 2014 and 15. And this is controlling for effort. And then um, kind of stable since then, maybe a little bit increasing, but the overall trend is decreasing. The dates that the birds are active, I've had them as early as March 5th and as late as the 25th of April, but 81% are in this small window of 20 days. So this makes counting them quite easy. You can you know, put your lion's share of observers out there during this just the short period. And the median date, that day that splits half the, the, the loons coming before and after is the 2nd of April. So half of the bird, 50% of the birds come after April 2nd, 50 before. And graphically, that just looks like this. It just shows you this peak of birds in this short window of time. These are five-day periods from the middle of March to toward the end of April. Okay, let's look again at the state of median passage uh, when half the loons have passed uh, before and half after. Overall, like I said, it was April 2nd. It is pretty variable from years. So 2009, it was as early as March 27th. And 2013, it was late as April 10th. That's, you know, that's 15 days or so uh, between them. So it might be really interesting to figure out what's controlling this, the, their passage. Why are some years late? Why are some years earlier? Okay, so one thing that we can, one data point that we could use to look at this is called sea surface temperatures. This is data that NOAA takes about once a week at all these buoys out in the Gulf of Mexico, actually all over the, I think they're all over the world by various organizations. And 
sea surface temperature anomalies, they look against the average. In blue, it's below average temperature. In red, it's above average temperatures. And these are both in March. And like in March 2013 was a very cold year. And the temperatures were colder than normal. In March of 2020, it was quite warm. Now, what's important for loons is, you know, they're feeding on fish almost exclusively by diving. And school populations of fish, they're, they're needed for the birds to survive. Um, and what happens is during the winter, the fish ascend and can feed in the cold water closer to the surface. During the winter, the fish descend and eventually probably, I, I need to get some more references on this, but they become out of the reach of the diving loon. So as the temperature warms during the spring, then we get warmer and warmer weather. The fish are descending further and further and they get out of reach of loons and the loons have to leave. So if you have a warm year, they're gonna leave earlier. If you have a cool year, they can leave later. So I did a regression. Each of these dots is a different year of data, a different median date, which is on the y-axis, the left axis. And then the sea surface temperature is on the x-axis, the bottom axis here. And there is an almost significant relationship, a negative relationship, which is the one that was predicted. On colder years, they leave a little bit later. On warmer years, they leave a little bit earlier. Um, I think with some more data that we could get this into the, the significant range. And this this will become important later when I start talking about climate change and other factors. The sea surface temperature data, you can get them from all over the place. I picked a spot like halfway between Tampa and St. George Island. The loons often uh, winter way offshore. So this was a kind of a good spot. And I chose March 1st. This is be right before they start migrating. So I thought this was a good point to be uh, to look at this relationship. Okay, then the other thing, um, another pattern is what time of the day the loons are passing. And there's quite a, there's a couple hour period. Uh, and then there's one flock of 12 at 6.30 p.m. that makes no sense at all. But 88% are recorded in the 60, 70 minute uh, window between 50 and 100 and two hours after Sunrise, uh, graphically, this looks like this. Here's when most birds are passing with kind of tails. This one is just after you get these long flights. And what I think is happening with these birds that are uh, coming later is that they're just wintering, they're starting further offshore. So if they're, when, if they're starting their flight 20 miles offshore, they're, not gonna, they're gonna get to Gainesville a half hour later than if they were starting right at Cedar Key. Okay, so one thing that I've always been interested in is what controls the numbers that we're seeing? Why can you go out and see 300 birds on one day and the next day there'll be 10 birds? So, you know, of course, the first thing to look at is weather. And Florida weather, as most of you probably know, in the spring is a general pattern. You get a cold front, with rain on day zero, the next couple of days, the winds shift to the Northwest and you have cold weather. Um, in days three to five, you start getting warmer, a bit warmer every day, you get nice, sunny, beautiful Florida weather. And if the fronts stall out in the latter days, six, seven and longer, you start getting fog, um, especially here in Gainesville. So, the days that are best for loon migration tend to be these days that are not during the front or not during the northwest winds, but like the two to four days after uh, when the winds switch from the northwest a little bit to the west or to the southwest, which gives the birds a tailwind. Um, the worst days are foggy days, whether these are the worst for the birds, you can't, they're worse for us because we can't see the birds migrating. But the rainy days are probably also bad. And the birds probably don't like them a bit either because they lose sight of the land and they will, won't have a place to ditch if the weather is bad. So here's one of these foggy days in the cemetery. Uh, and what happened in 2020 was really interesting. We had a stalled weather front from the 22nd to the 30th of March. This high pressure system just stalled out 
and it got foggier and foggier and foggier. And in Gainesville and Paynes Prairie Basin, it's low lying and you get the fog build up and the fog creeps into Gainesville, I think because of the, all the asphalt and cement and stuff. And so it just negated pretty much any sort of loon migration. Um, and we had very few loons on, at these stations, uh, two to eight. But we also have a count here at the Scott Robinson's place, uh, just south of Micanopy, is outside this fog belt that builds up. And in that period, this is one of the, especially the latter part of this period, is one of the strongest times of loon migration during the spring. So in stations two to eight, we had in this eight days, nine days, we only had 126 loons. And then in just in this one station, in the same period, he had 180. And what I think was happening was the lo incoming loons were seeing this mass of fog and they were just skirting the edge of it, going around it, rather than fly flying over or through it. So that was kind of a neat pattern. It's again, this emphasizes this loon decision-making about the path they're taking and their you know, need to be kind of aware of their surroundings so that they can minimize uh, potential harm along their migra migratory path. Okay, another thing that's interesting about loons is their age. You can age them, uh, especially the juveniles. You see this one up here uh, at top is a, you, it's all white below. It looks like kind of a winter adult or a winter bird. And then loons molt, um, the adults and older, uh, older immature birds, they molt completely on their winter grounds. So sometime usually in January and February, they replace all their wing feathers and most of their body plumage and by spring migration, they're in fresh plumage. Um, and so they're easily, you can easily tell the juveniles from the adults. I think some of the younger birds uh, have still have molt going on in, um, in March. So sometimes you can see these modeled birds as well. So there might be able to age these three age classes as they pass over. Um, So this brings in another collaboration. Um, Kevin Keenow worked starting in the, oh, about 2012, I think, started putting satellite transmitters on some of the loons that he was able to catch on their breeding grounds on lakes in Minnesota and Michigan. And these birds, uh, he, he caught them, put the transmitters on both juveniles and adults. And then he was able to follow some of them for up to two years as they you know, gave their data, the, transmitted their data to the satellites. He published a paper just last year uh, uh, in the Journal of Avian Biology on this, uh, on this research. And so what he found is that these birds, they're breeding up in the upper Midwest in the US. He works for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And they stage on Lake Michigan, both the adults and the juveniles. And then they head south, stopping at reservoirs and rivers and stuff on the way down. And they winter to their wintering grounds in the Gulf of Mexico. Almost, I think all, almost all the birds that he banded wintered in the Gulf of Mexico. So there's the wintering range. The, win, the adults tend to winter a little bit more offshore out the continental shelf than the birds, the, the immature birds and juveniles, which wintered inshore. I'm not sure why uh, he really didn't have an explanation for this. Maybe it's just safer for them or something. Okay, and then spring migration, what he found was that the adults headed straight back north, headed up to those rivers and reservoirs in the upper, in the Midwest and to the Great Lakes and to their breeding grounds. But what he found was in the, uh, some of the juveniles, most of the juveniles that he tagged, uh, they did the cross Florida trip. They did the trip over the Florida Peninsula, over Gainesville, and then they flew up into the Atlantic, the North Atlantic off Canada. So loons are very territorial. The adults are very territorial on their little lakes and they don't want any other loons. So any other loon comes and they'll chase it away. The loons don't breed until they're five years old. So what the young, don't want to do is go back to their breeding grounds. They, they don't want to be near these nasty adults. They want to hop over the Florida Peninsula, be safe flying up the Atlantic coast, and then they can go to the rich fishing grounds 
off of Northeast Canada and spend the summer there, get fat and come back. Some of the birds uh, in the Northern Gulf of Mexico actually went to Lake Jacassi in South Carolina and then flew out toward Chesapeake Bay and went over there. But a great majority of them went over the Florida Peninsula. So a lot of the birds that we're probably seeing in, in Gainesville are younger birds. And here's a little tidbit from this paper. Um, the juvenile migrants, uh, juvenile loons migrate during first spring from wintering sites in the Gulf of Mexico to summer in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Nova Scotia. Juvenile mortality was largely linked to parasitic infection and emaciation. And spring appeared to be the survival bottleneck among juvenile loons monitored during our study. So they were able to follow loons throughout the whole year, but it was this critical period was in spring when they're migrating, uh, starting to migrate, that it was their crucial time that, uh, and they could, they, that they needed to survive. That was the survival bottleneck. So what did we find in Gainesville if you're looking at age uh, composition? Um, they don't breed until they're five, like I said. So most of the juveniles look like this, two to five, two to three years old like this. And then adult-like is both birds that are not breeding, probably like three to five years old. And then the adults that do breed will also look like this. The older non-breeders are non-separable. So the predictions that you can draw from this, these facts are that more juveniles should be going over Gainesville than at St. Mark's. And the juveniles should maybe be flying a little bit later. The reason for this is that they don't have, the adults need to get to the breeding territories. It's generally more successful if they set up a breeding territory early. The juveniles aren't, don't have this pressure. They just need to get up to Canada where they can get uh, feed off the rich fishing grounds for the summer. So what were the results? In Gainesville, we were able to age about 34% of the birds. This is just in 2020 and 21. 9% um, were juvenile, 6% were modeled, and adult-like were 85%. So 15% were definitely young, 85%, probably a good number of them might have been young too. They just weren't distinguishable from breeding adults. Unfortunately, St. Mark's, we weren't able to do this study. Uh, we, Paul wasn't able to recruit enough people. He was just keeping track of numbers and wasn't able to have another spotter to figure out the ages. Uh, this was kind of a limitation from COVID in 2020. And then the whole thing was shut down in 2021. So there's a lot of work to do on this question still. Do adults migrate earlier, like I predicted? Um, it was pretty close. Uh, this is looking at the median date of adults uh, and then the median date of young. There were more uh, uh, young after the, um, after the median date, but the statistics were not significant. So um, really we probably just need a little bit more data there to show a pattern or maybe there's no pattern. Okay, so that's kind of the, results of this citizen science project and all this work that we've done. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about conservation of common loons. It's a species of concern because of declining populations. They're quite vulnerable in a number of parts of their life cycle. Um, so what we need, first you need a baseline. You need to know the numbers. You need a way to monitor the numbers. Loons breed across a vast, uh, breeding area on little lakes, it's very hard to census. They winter offshore, maybe even 100 miles offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. And then it's also very hard to monitor these expand, expanded populations in winter. But what happens in Gainesville is that they're, and in St. Mark's, is that they're funneled. All these large populations in the winter are funneled into a little migration corridor and that gives us an opportunity for a lot more accurate monitoring of populations. And I showed this graph that I showed before of the trends, and this is the type of work we can do to monitor whether populations are increasing, decreasing, stable. Um, but this is giving us a good baseline at least for doing this kind of work. 
Okay, now the ugly part, Deepwater Horizon. This occurred in 2010 on April 20th. And if you remember my dates, April 20th is most of the loons, all the loons have left by April 20th. So why did it have an impact on loons? Well, it had a huge impact on loons. Like it's estimated between 800 and 1200 loons died uh, from the immediate after effects of the oil spill of the Deepwater Horizon. These were mainly young birds that were still had yet to migrate. Um, it just shows that these th this type of spill is just incredibly damaging, potentially damaging to loon population. If it had occurred a month earlier, it probably would have wiped out. It could have wiped out tens of thousands of loons. So this uh, sort of thing is very important. Part of the reason that Kevin Keenow was able to do this long-term study with the satellite transmitters, which are very expensive, is that money from the uh, Deepwater Horizon settlements was used to be able to fund his study to show what, how the loons were, where they were in the winter, how they were using the landscape uh, and such. As I mentioned before, Kevin Keenow's study also showed the importance of winter in migratory habitats. It's always been kind of a neglected part. Uh, people were studying loons on their breeding grounds, what kind of lakes they need, what kind of pH in the lakes was important for them, but they really weren't looking at their winter and migratory habitats. And from his work, the, for juvenile birds at least, the spring migration, the period in spring is the bottleneck for survival. If they can get through and get to their 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 summering grounds off of eastern Canada, they're going to be they do a lot better. So it's very important that they survive this bottleneck. It has great effects on their population. Okay, and lastly, climate change. Um, as I mentioned before, the temperature of the water is probably very important in the ability of common loons to find their prey. And what we're having is increased temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico. So as the temperatures increase in spring, they're going to have to leave earlier and earlier if we continue this trend. And that's going to cause the birds, the breeders especially, they might be still forced out of the Gulf of Mexico, but their summer habitats are not clear of ice yet. So they won't be able to breed. So it's kind of going to impact them there. For the juvenile birds, it's going to be doubly important because they're, um, they're reliant on getting fat and getting uh, getting through the survival bottleneck in the spring. And they have to have adequate food to do this, of course, their prey in order to get over the Florida Peninsula and up into Canada. So climate change is a really scary um, factor uh, for the future of these populations. But hopefully we can, you know, with our knowledge about what's happening with the loons, or at least we're a little bit better situated to deal with this. Um, and you never, you never know. Hopefully things will improve with our climate change uh, initiatives in this country and around the world. So um, I would like to thank my collaborators, especially Gainesville's great bird watching community. We have a phenomenal community of birders here and they were able to fill all these slots and get out and watch loons and you know, refine my study, uh, especially Rex Rowan and the way that he has coordinated uh, the earlier parts of my study. Um, Paul Spitzer, of course, my wife, Mary, has helped greatly. I've been through three different dogs. I've been doing this since 2001. Uh, unfortunately, dogs don't live forever. Ani at the top, Newman in the middle. And this just this year, new, uh, Rain, our white German shepherd, is ready to join me for some loon watching. And then Alachua Audubon has also been very... Um, great in providing, they have an internship program and I've had a number of interns on both the uh, 2020 and 2021 counts. And so thanks to them. And I will gladly answer any questions and thank you very much for your uh, listening. Thank you, Andy, that was great. Yes, excellent. We, we did have um, a quest, couple questions. Great. Um, Cindy wants to know, do loons land in freshwater lakes in central Florida? Um, well, they do in Alachua County and Noonan's Lake, uh, lake Santa Fe is a deeper lake 
Uh, and there is usually a flock of 40 or so that, that actually winter there. Um, the loons that migrate over the peninsula don't seem to land ever, as far as I know. They're, like I said, they're up their mind. They're going to go the whole distance. Uh, Lake Weir, outside of Ocala, also has a good flock of wintering loons sometimes. I think there's been as many as 100 there during the winter some years. Um, but um, again, I don't know. I was talking to Scott Robinson today, and he's going to bring up with Marion Audubon uh, to kind of expand this a little bit south to see if there's loon migration happening to the south. So to get even broaden the uh, this migration, look at this migration quarter. The my eighth site, that northernmost site near Hague Gary, was very had very little migration. So that seems to be the northern limit to the migration. Mark Hanen was just pointing out that. They show up in Toledo, Ohio in mid-March and rest in ponds and lakes as they make their way north to the breeding grounds. Yeah, that, that's interesting because that's a little bit earlier than, that, that might be birds from the northern Gulf of Mexico that, uh, that Paul Spitzer would look at because they, they, I think they migrate a little bit earlier. And so if they're leaving, they could even leave. I don't know if Paul is gone as early as the 10th of March or so. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, that's good that they, they can survive up there. If they're pushed off the Gulf um, by warming temperatures, then maybe there, there are, there's havens for them south of their breeding grounds where they, could, they can kind of wait out until their lakes uh, defreeze off, <laughs> I guess the word. John Marshall wanted to know how long, do you have any idea how long it takes to migrate from the Gulf of Mexico to the northern breeding grounds is such as Michigan. I'm not really sure. I'd have to look at the Kevin Keenow. He would have the exact number of days that you know for his adults that he would he could he calculated. Um, I don't have that data right at my. I know they do it in a number of days. They they often loons will often uh, migrate and then spend a couple of days refueling and then and they only tend to fly two or three hours a day. So the, the, this pattern of this, what they do over the Florida Peninsula is kind of repeated even I think if they're over the ocean, they just will migrate in the morning and get, get up, you know, go for until they can fish the rest of the day and fatten up for their, I think and flight is very energetically demanding for loons. They're very heavy bodied. They don't have great huge wings. They have pretty small wings for their great huge bodies. So they use a lot of energy to fly. Cindy um, was asking if all the loons are seen by observation from the ground, how do they know about the birds that are returns? So up in St. Mark's is that the birds are, they're so close to the ground that they watch them and they come overhead and they're just gaining altitude because they're right off the Gulf. They don't need to get any altitude they, until they get over land. And as they watch them, they're getting altitude right at the, where they meet the land at the head of the, at the big bend where they're, they're kind of funneled by the shape of the coastline. And they, they get overhead and they watch them and they watch them and watch them. And then they'll actually see them turn around. And there's kind of cues that they're gonna do this by, because of the, the uh, you know, there might be a big wall of rain clouds or something. So all of a sudden the birds, you, you're watching loons and all of a sudden there's birds going against the flow. You know, they're going the wrong way. <laughs> and so that's how they detect the returnees. And she just also commented that she has heard that they are seen it in Lake Conway here in the Orlando area. Yeah, that might be wintering birds. That could be migrants. Um, it's not, I see there's another question about, you know, migrating Florida south of Gainesville. And I was touched upon that Marion Audubon might help to look down there this year. Um, as for, you know, just looking through eBird and resources like that, it doesn't seem, it seems like the migration corridor, they really use this Gainesville corridor intensely and maybe don't use other avenues, pathways really at all or very little. And then Deborah wanted to know, in winter in the Gulf, are they spread out or close together? And how far are they 
And are there any easy places to see them? Good questions. Um, they, they can be both. Um, it, like at Cedar Key, uh, a couple Christmas counts ago, they had a big group of like over a hundred, like over a couple hundred uh, in one group. So they can group up during the winter. Um, uh, Cameron Cox had several hundred, I think it was near the Sunshine Skyway in Tampa Bay a couple of years ago during the winter. Um, Cedar Key is all, I, I usually do the Christmas count there and bird around there. And you could always find common loons during the winter. Uh, you often need a scope from land, um, but the numbers is pretty variable. And I think it has, a, you know, it has all, it's where the fish are. And so that might depend on sea surface temperatures and big, big areas like that. Um, Kathy was pointing out that they sometimes show up at Lake Apopka. Uh -huh. um, and Greg was asking, is there any indication that loons are migrating? And I think you mentioned this across Florida, south of Gainesville. Yeah, that's what I was trying to, to say. There's not much evidence for that or not much from, from just south of Micanopy. We don't we really don't know. That's one thing that, you know, having people from Marion County, from Ocala can give us some good, you know, if maybe they'll, maybe they'll find nothing and we'll know that the Gainesville pathway is the pathway, or maybe it's a little bit broader than we think. Don't know yet. And then Mark has mentioned that he also photographed a few at Merritt Island, Titusville during the winter. Yeah, there's, there's a population that winters along the Atlantic coast, south all the way to South Florida. Um, those birds, uh, the, I've looked at Christmas count results and it, it's probably fewer than a hundred on the Christmas counts, whereas it's, you know, 500 to 800 or something along the Gulf coast, and then a couple thousand along the Panhandle coast. So for some reason, they don't like the Atlantic coast quite as much for wintering as the Gulf of Mexico. Chris was mentoring wonderful program, he said, and he's gonna remember you. the flying bowling pin reference. Yeah. And it was asking if they can be seen, loons can be seen throughout the keys. They're pretty rare, you get that far south. They, they, they have occasional birds, but they, they just don't winter farther south than that. So I, like I, thought, I see someone mentioned the hawk watch, and I, that's just too far south for them. They just, there's not enough prey food, I guess, for them. Or there's enough up here that they don't need to go that far south. <laughs> Mark Heinen was wondering if there are any other species of loons that show up. I've had two records of red-throated loons flying over with the common loons. So they're rare winter residents in Florida. Um, there's, you know, up on the Panhandle coast, they have several every, Christ every Christmas count, every winter. And then around Jacksonville, there's usually some red-throateds and the, occasionally they're, they're on the Gulf of Mexico side. So they're very small numbers. I, you know, two of 10,000 for me. And the Pacific, there was a Pacific loon that wintered in Noonan's Lake, uh, three different winters, I think, but that's never showed up on the, on the loon watch. Very good. Any other questions? Those are great questions. I really thank everybody for thinking about this. And um, I've, you know, Someone suggested a while back that we should use the air traffic control people at the Gainesville airport to help us <laughs> census. Cause apparently some of the, the, these bigger migrants actually can show up on some of the Doppler stuff. So that's another idea that I've been toying with, but I don't want to, I, I don't want to do it at a desktop count loons, you know, looking at computer images. I want to be out and watch loons and swallowtail kites. And, you know, it's, it's fun just going out there because I see all sorts of things flying by, not just loons. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. Thanks for listening. That was a great program. Yeah, I hope to publish the, you know, now that we have this expanded citizen science thing, I definitely do to have a better publication uh, in some bird journal. Great. Fantastic. And next week we're back to Gainesville with Tim Hardenstock. Okay, he'll he'll spice <laughs> things up with 
Lincoln yes. sparrows and other other things mm -hmm. that are little brown, brown jobs. <laughs> <laughs> little brown. Sorry. Very All good. right, I'm gonna stop the recording. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you again, Andy. Yeah, Bye. thank you very much for the invitation. Okay, thank you.